Thank you everyone for being here today at the Citizens Climate International Climate Advocate Training. It's quite focused on Africa. So I thank you, all of you from across Africa that are here today, from Cabo Verde to Kenya to Nigeria and other countries, uh, Zambia. Thank you everyone for being here. I think there'll be more as well. So our solution to climate change is people, and we thank you for being on our team. Our learning objectives today, I hope by the end of our hour and a half together, you will absorb our history and culture, including our mission, values, and our five levers of political will. You'll be able to articulate the benefits of carbon pricing and border carbon adjustments. And you will learn more about how to be a citizen lobbyist. You are part of a global organization that was founded in 2007, and it currently has about 145 active chapters outside the USA. Uh, last time I checked, about two weeks ago, there was uh, 17,613 uh, people outside the USA, supporters, um, and, you're, and they're organized within 76 countries with 51 countries with active CCL chapters. Um, it, Canada joined in 2010. It was founded in the USA, um, Australia, and Sweden in 2013. And by 2015, uh, David Michael Tarangua had connected with our executive director and chapters started popping up in Africa, starting in Nigeria and then all over. So this is wonderful. Our founder was Marshall Saunders and he passed away in December of 2019. I wish you all could have met him. He had the most generous spirit I've ever met here in my lifetime and I'm not young. <laughs> And um, Marshall realized that ordinary people like you and me would, during this climate crisis and this global crisis um, that we are most certainly in right now, it's more than just climate, would have to organize, educate ourselves, give up our hopelessness and gain the skills necessary to be effective with our governments. Thank you for being part of his dream you are what he was hoping would happen. So our mission is to build the political will for a livable world. And we do this by empowering citizen volunteers to have breakthroughs in exercising their personal and political power. You are all so powerful. Never underestimate the power of one. We have four defined program areas at Citizens Climate International. Today's focus will be on volunteer, uh, helping you become uh, advocates for the climate crisis and specifically carbon pricing. Yes, and we do focus a lot on carbon pricing. And as you will see, we do see the bigger picture, but we have a couple other program areas that we won't really touch on today, but we also do civic diplomacy within the World Bank, the IMF, the G7, G20, and the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. And um, we also do research and, um, uh, and especially writing, and that's the resilience intelligence. We have core values here at Citizens Climate Lobby and Citizens Climate International. And this is the part where I hope a couple of you will consider sharing. So as I read through and talk about each of our core values at Citizens Climate International and Citizens Climate Lobby, I want you to think which core value appeals to you the most. So which one of these really, like when you hear it, you just know that that's something that really speaks to you. 
And so when I'm done, I'll ask you to put those answers in the chat and maybe a couple of you um, can actually speak out. So at Citizens Climate Lobby, one of our superpowers is focus. And yes, we focus on carbon pricing and a very specific policy called climate income. And we do that because, not because we think it's the only solution to the climate crisis, but we know for it to be a very powerful solution to the climate crisis, to cut emissions in a socially just way. It's also, we focus on this particular policy and training people to lobby for it because it takes a lot of time and energy to train people to, to, to work on this. And if we switched our focus all the time um, or, or too much, or um, we would lose a lot of uh, the training that we've done previously. So our focus in many ways is a means to an end. If, if we get, a, the goal is a livable world. And by focusing on this particular policy, we're pushing our politicians to create socially just and evidence-based policies to protect our planet from global climate catastrophe. We do see the bigger picture. We know that there are many other solutions. We have um, the integrity, um, to, you know, we do our research. We, you know, we're, we do our best to be on time and we are very evidence-based in the work that we do. We are ruthlessly, hopelessly optimistic as an organization. And why? Because at our core, almost every single one of us on this planet are good. We believe that humans are good and we all want the best for each other. There's just a few right now that we have to deal with, but they're a minority. Most of us are really good and we can draw upon that human goodness of taking care of each other and create a better world. So we are optimistic. We know that we can overcome the crisis. We totally embrace diversity. I am, you know, so honored uh, every time I get to do these workshops with people all over the world. It is, I learn almost, just, I learn probably more than what I actually teach. So as well, it, 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 every voice is needed. Everyone needs to be heard. This is how we will solve the crisis. We are one, the human race is one, and we will do this together, embracing each other. Di personal power is what is the energy behind Citizens Climate Lobby and Citizens Climate International. You are all so powerful. Again, never underestimate the power of one. one. And we're not just about one time doing something once. We build long-term relationships with our politicians and our community. This is how we will you know, build that trust and that momentum that is needed. Um, and we're doing it right now. It's not how we're going to do it. It is how we've been doing it since 2007. And we are truly nonpartisan. So focus, integrity, optimism, diversity, personal power, relationships. Which one speaks the most to you? Which one of these core values at Citizens Climate International, when you heard about it, as I was talking about it, which one speaks the most to you? You can write it in the chat or you can unmute yourself and say it. So please just go ahead. This is where we get to know each other. A little bit in the chat. Integrity, okay, wonderful. Hello, Kathy, diversity. Oh, nice, uh, nice to meet you. Yes, uh, yeah. Please uh, identify uh, which core value speaks to you. Diversity, for me it's oh. diversity. I believe in a diverse world. Yeah. Wonderful. Yes. Anyone else? Thank you for sharing. There's some in the chat. If you look over, 
personal power for Lorene, integrity for uh, uh, yes. Yeah, um, uh, go ahead. Yes. As for me, I go for focus, being focused. The focus, yes, absolutely. Focus gives you time, uh, so much time to like savor the planet. Um, and yeah, thank you, Yusa, being nonpartisan. Um, yeah, and you have to be apolitical. In, because of your laws. That's a really good point. Again, being educated um, by our membership. Thank you that there are laws in certain countries as well that, that for um, these sorts of civil society groups must be nonpartisan. So do know your country and local laws as well. That's, that's something new for me. Hey, hey Mike, do you, do you want to share anything? Please go ahead. Oh, yes, Kathy. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I just wanted to mention that um, of all the people on this call, we have um, we have four people who, after this call, their groups would be activated. Um, I just wanted to mention that um, as we go ahead. So I don't want them to drop off this call by any means. So first we have Lorraine Brito from Cape Verde. I will have to learn how to pronounce the, the capital of Cape Verde. So Lorraine, uh, the name is Lorraine. Uh, something like uh, uh -huh. the capital the name, of Cape Verde. The capital is Praia. Praia, yes, I saw yes. that, Praia. Then we have also um, Diane. Diane is from Kenya, uh, so we have a new another group coming up in Vihiga, in Kenya. Um, in Nigeria, there are two. We have Tine Ageno, who is uh, representing the Makodi group, and then we have uh, our our very old member Yahaya Dangana, who wants to start another group in Lafia, and all of them are here. Now, um, why the other volunteers that are here also are, are learning, it's important just to note that these ones, after this training, can get their groups activated. Thank you, Kathy. You can go on now. Yeah, thank you. That is so exciting. And it, uh, it's pronounced Lorene. Am I pronouncing that right, Loren? Loren. Exactly, Loren. Loren. Yes. Loren. Loren beat. Yes. Loren beat. Okay, yeah, got to get that N sound in there. And it's a short E, not a <laughs> yes. long E. Okay. Right. Wonderful. Yes. Thank you for your patience with our pronunciation. And and Praia is your capital city. Yes. And, and welcome everyone um, who are you. starting new chapters. Thank you, Diane. I think I'm at Diane and in cop, at cop I, if I'm correct. Okay, so um, yeah, so thank you for those wonderful shares. Um, yes, uh, well, yeah, we can, we totally can make things happen. Wonderful. Okay, so thank you for those wonderful shares. We will continue. Ah, and that is the end of getting to know the culture of CCL and CCI. Um, and we're switching to carbon pricing. So take a deep breath. <sighs> Open up the carbon pricing part of your brain, you know, the, and let's start learning together more about carbon pricing. There are three very explicit ways to price carbon. There is cap and trade, also known as emissions trading scheme, where governments put a cap on emissions and industries um, must stay under that. If they go over, uh, they pay a penalty. And if they're under, they get a credit. Um, yeah, and it, it's, it's been working at, uh, on the planet. It's just a very difficult system to roll out for the entire planet. Um, it requires a, boots on the ground and lots of infrastructure at the government level to make this happen. 
but it, it is one of the ways to price carbon pollution. Another way is through a carbon tax. So the government could put a, a tax on pollution and take that money and put it back into the general coffers or the, or the money that the government collects and then put it into programs. Now, how many people here wanna pay more taxes? <laughs> no, probably not many people. Um, uh, we can price pollution and give the money back to the people. And there is so much evidence that it will decrease emissions dramatically while also reducing income inequality. And that is the policy that we advocate for at Citizens Climate Lobby, because we not only have a climate crisis happening on this planet, we also have a crisis of wealth and equity. So how does it work? So the government puts an incrementally increasing price on carbon pollution at the source, the mine, the well, or the point of entry into the economy, does this over time, gives all the money back to the people, regardless of income, regardless of carbon footprint, and includes border carbon adjustments. And what these are is if a commodity that crosses a country, it crosses your border and you have a carbon price, but it comes from a country without a, an equivalent carbon price, you charge a, you charge a fee on, on it as it crosses the border and collect that money. So that's it. Incrementally rising fee on pollution, all the money back to the people border carbon adjustments. Now, this is almost Canada's Greenhouse Gas Pollution Pricing Act policy, except for we don't have border carbon adjustments. So it is actually working on the planet in my country. I'm Canadian, if you didn't know that. So we're not for or against, we are for climate income. So I'm going to explain it again, and this is explained in what we call a laser talk, which is a short talking point. So we place a fee on fossil fuels at the source, the mine, the well, or the port of entry into the economy. It starts, and we, we ask for it to start at $50 a ton CO2 equivalent and increase $10 a ton annually. And we turn the net revenues to households equally, and we know that this will protect low and middle income households. And then it includes a border adjustment on goods imported from or exported to countries without an equivalent price on carbon. That's it, but let's keep going. So like I said, Canada has this sort of policy, except for we don't have um, border carbon adjustments. We have an alter alternative policy. I'm gonna quickly jump into that. So yeah, most of us in Canada, are like all households, small businesses, and any industry under 10,000 tons of CO2 a year pays the fuel consumption and heating fuel. And we don't, protect, we don't pay it directly uh, to the government, it's embedded into the cost of everything. And instead of border carbon adjustments in Canada, we have what's called output-based pricing system. And you, you don't have to memorize all this, but just know that we have an alternative system to, to help our heavy emitting industries um, stay competitive as we rise, rise the carbon price in Canada. So what this is, is it's kind of like cap and trade, but there's no cap. So every, there's a whole, whole series of industries and they each have a standard for which they're to meet. If they're under it, they get a credit. If they're over it, they, they pay a penalty. They pay a carbon price. And um, so, and they're, they're subject to uh, a carbon price on the portions of the, the um, emissions above the facility limit. So this is Canada's carbon pricing policy, pretty much carbon fee and dividend, but without border carbon adjustments. 
And so this is how much emissions it will reduce between 2018 and 2022. It is by far in, in our um in our main climate policies that we have designed and more are coming, it is by far the largest source of um, reductions of carbon emissions in our country, according to our own government data. And there's an institute in Canada called the Pembina Institute. And they, um, they looked at uh, the government data between 2018 and 2022. And they found if we didn't enact these policies, all of these policies, we have business as usual, our emissions would go up. If we um, did enact these policies, but no carbon pricing, um, yeah, we would reduce emissions eventually. But um, look how much with carbon pricing, Canada's emissions will be reduced. And PCF just means pan-Canadian framework. It's just like the technical term for the how our government designed this. So the take-home message in Canada, carbon pricing is an essential component of a, of a cost-effective climate plan. So right now, Canada is studying border carbon adjustments. And currently, as I said earlier, our heavy emitters pay a much reduced carbon price in the output-based pricing system. But um, our parliamentary budget office and another think tank called um, Canadians for Clean Prosperity looked at what would happen if the heavy industry paid the full price of, on their carbon pollution and the output-based pricing system was replaced with border carbon adjustments. And basically, we see a massive reduction in, in greenhouse gas emissions compared to the baseline scenario. So this is what we ha currently have planned. Um, uh, uh, no, this is what we currently have planned. But if we include border carbon adjustments and make full industry fully uh, priced, I know that 206% doesn't mean much to you, but we massively uh, go back. Uh, go, you know, reduce emissions. It's huge. And I, I think it's something like 60 uh, megatons if by adding a border carbon adjustment. And this data is corroborated not only by our own government research agency called the Parliamentary Budget Office, which reports directly to our parliamentarians, but it also is um, confirmed uh, similarly because they use different modeling systems uh, with Canadians for clean prosperity. So I just gave you some technical stuff, but you're like, but really what sells the carbon pricing are two things I'd like to bring up. First, I'd like to say that it, that it um, puts money in our pocket. And yeah, it does. And by, and the money collected from the carbon fee is given as a dividend or climate income payment to every person to spend with no restrictions. And most low and income people will come out financially ahead or break even. And I'll show you that data. But this is like the big selling point. So here are three pieces of data. Let's first focus on this nature article from November 29th, 2021. They found if all countries adopt the necessary uniform global carbon tax and return the revenues to their citizens on an equal per capita basis, like Canada does, it will be possible to meet at least the two degree target. Obviously, we have to get to 1.5, but also increase well being, reduce inequality, and alleviate poverty. These results indicate that it is possible for a society to implement strong climate action without compromising goals for equity and development. So why is that? So let's go look at these graphs over on the left. This is called the Brontosaurus graph, and it shows the share of growth in total carbon emissions between uh, 20, 1990 and 2015. And as we can see, 
the richest 5%, um, consume a lot of carbon. And if you put the, together the, the richest 5% and then the next richest 10%, they consume almost half of the global emissions and the rest of us consume way less. Um, if you look at the data, clearly you can see um, why lower income people come out ahead. This, the green data, this green bar here is for all the G20s countries for which they had data. And I apologize, I don't have African data, um, but I'll, I'll show you some comparable data shortly. But this is another graph um, from Oxfam showing that the top 10% of earners in every single country consume way more carbon pollution um, or create way more carbon pollution than average. And um, here's the average. So they push up the average and the bottom 40% and bottom 50% of earners consume less. So that is why most of us come out ahead. Same as for Canada, our own parliamentary budget office found that most of us come out ahead. And even when they have to, the net pay has to happen, look at how much like our biggest, um, like the highest income quintiles in Canada who make like over $200,000 a year Canadian will have to pay $200. That's equivalent of one fancy cup of coffee a week at a restaurant. I think they can afford one fancy cup of coffee per week, don't you? So you're like, okay, but this is North American data and G20 data. Well, how about Africa? Okay. So apologies if your country is not on here. Um, and this is a huge tech, technical graph here. But let's focus in on what these bars all mean. So we got country, the Gini index, the highest income quintile, and the lowest income quintile. And again, apologies if your country is, is not here. So we know Canada, the United States, at least the bottom two thirds of income earners are going to come out ahead in a climate income, uh, po with a climate income policy. And so now if we look at the distributions of income shared by the highest income quintile and then the next and the next and the next, all the way down to, to the lowest income quintile, you can see similar distributions of global patterns of wealth inequality. So because, um, you know, like USA, um, you, you know, has a Gini index of 4.414, you know, like, and Canada, you know, is down a little bit. Regardless, you know, m most of our countries, you know, the top wealth, uh, the top 20% of wealth is literally held by, you know, almost half of the, and often more than half, of uh, the 20% uh, the of earners in our countries. And then um, the income shared by the poorest is, is much lower. So the take home message is right here on the right. If this like just totally blew your mind, global patterns of wealth inequality are similar. Thus one would expect most lower and middle income households to come out, e out, out ahead with climate income. Is, did I make that clear? Or is there any questions or comments before I continue? And again, apologies if your country's not on here and I think I miss Gambia, but any comments as I continue? I'll look in the chat. Okay, I think you got it. So that's one thing. So again, the reminder, the big take home message is Sorry. First take home message is most low and middle income people will come out financially ahead or break in even. It's going to put money in people's pockets. And if you were listening, if anyone was listening to the IPCC report this morning, one of the big take home messages for adaptation is we're going to need social programs to make sure that people are okay. And one of the ways our governments are going to have to do that is to get money to us so we can buy the food and the energy that we need based on our own needs. So 
But okay, yeah, it reduces inequality, but uh, we're in a climate emergency. Does it cut emissions? Yeah, it does. Climate income is literally the single most powerful tool we have to get to net zero by 2050. I'm a, a scientist by training. I make my word, my I make my living by what I say, and I confidently can say that climate income is the single most powerful tool we have to get to net zero by 2050. So one of the ways I know this is because of modeling. And there's this awesome modeling agency called OnRoads. Um, like, and you can learn how to run this modeler. And I had someone set up for me the global impact of removing all the fossil fuel subsidies globally, subsidizing clean energy globally, maximizing tree growth globally, maximizing carbon pricing globally, and looked at the on the global primary sources of energy, on um, global air pollution, and global temperatures. Which one? Oh, no. OK, so this is what it looks like when you go onto on-roads, right? You're like, oh, OK, it's like really super busy. So let's focus on the three part, four parts here. Here on the left is the global sources of primary energy with coal, oil, gas, renewables, bioenergy, nuclear, and new zero technologies. I don't know what that means, actually. Um, and then there is the baseline here. And then there's um, uh, the um, air pollution from the various sources. Okay, And that air pollution is often described as the size of the molecule, PM2.5. And when it gets into your body, it does nasty things to your lungs. It does nasty things to your cardiovascular system and probably also leads to dementia, uh, early onset. So yeah, you really don't want it around. And it also causes asthma in our children. It's really bad. And what's even worse about it is it often low income households are like in areas where there's really bad air pollution. So yeah, we want to get rid of it. So, and here's global temperatures and here's all the toggles you can play with. So here are the impacts of the four thing, four uh, parameters we changed. We removed all fossil fuel subsidies. And, and those are direct subsidies from governments, okay? And as you can see, it barely reduces, doesn't really reduce anything because fossil fuel subsidies from governments, the direct ones are such a small source of the income for the, for the fossil fuel companies that it really doesn't affect their bottom line and it really doesn't change behavior. They just pass that cost on to the consumer and it would only be a tiny little bit and it really wouldn't change behavior. Now that's not to say uh, we shouldn't get rid of these fossil fuel subsidies, most of them, because some of them are, we're gonna have to carefully unwind ourselves from as well, uh, especially, well, that's a, another story, but yeah, it's, it's morally wrong to like keep subsidizing an industry that's killing our planet. But keep in mind that removing them barely has any impact on global temperatures. And we do support removing of fossil fuel subsidies at Citizens Climate Lobby and Citizens Climate International. If we could maximize all clean energy subsidies, that would reduce temperatures by 0.4 degrees. This is a surprising one to many. If we could maximize tree growth by reducing deforestation and replanting trees, it would only take 0.2 degrees off the planet now, again, I'm a biologist by training. Tree growth is so important for biodiversity and adaptation, and it's an extremely important thing to do. Um, just keep in mind that this is what it does to global temperatures. And just like removing fossil fuel subsidies, yeah, we want to maximize tree growth as well. We totally support that. According to the OnRose simulator, look at what maximizing carbon pricing does. It shaves a full degree off the planet. And if we do it, the C uh, the with climate income, it also reduces income inequality. So yeah, and that's it for carbon pricing. So I'm gonna stop sharing for a moment and uh, see if you have any questions about carbon pricing or comments. Maybe David, Michael, is there anything you'd like to add to get the conversation going? And then we'll get into our last bits. Uh, Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay, I have I have a comment. 
Yeah, go ahead, please. Great, Cathy. Thank you. And uh, good afternoon, every other person. I was wondering if the dividends that are paid back to the middle and low income uh, citizens, if there are guide, guidelines on the kinds of goods and services which they should buy with the dividends that are made from uh, uh, the climate income. Because I'm thinking if the government saves monies from, from, from the income or makes money from the income and gives it to the citizens and there is no guidance on what they use it for, there may be the tendencies for them to buy uh, carbon products and that may defeat the, the aim of the program. I, I was just thinking through it, but I'm wondering, are there guidelines on how uh, citizens also spend monies made from climate income? That's a really good question. Um, so imagine you're a consumer and the price of carbon pollution is rising. And that means any product where the companies have not taken care to reduce their, um, their, their consumption of fossil fuels, their product's going to have a higher price than companies who are taking care. So it's automatically because the, the companies and the businesses that are, are reducing their emissions are going to be paying lower costs um, because they're not going to be paying that car. They're, they're going to be shifting their system. That in itself will start to shift um, as well. It's really hard to get people to, um, well, it's almost impossible to get people to, to, to direct them on how to pay on, on what to buy. So really the market will take care of itself. <laughs> Those companies that don't, you know, that keep their carbon emissions high are going to have higher costs and the consumers will gravitate towards lower costs, but also to stay competitive. And there's so much data at the um, carbon pricing leadership coalition at the World Bank that companies that do price carbon pollution have a competitive uh, advantage, even if they're only doing it internally. So great question. And the, uh, the answer is the market will take care of itself. Does that make sense? <laughs> okay. Thank you. Oh, no, it was an awesome question. We get it all the time. I loved it. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. And I love how Nigerians say thank you and are so polite, just like <laughs> Canadians. I feel so at home right now. It's so cool. <laughs> Sounds good to know. Yeah, cool. Okay. Thanks. Other questions? So that's your carbon pricing um, education. And if you want the slides, I can share them at the end and we'll have the recording for this and we'll create a page on our citizensclimate.earth as well um, so you can um, find out more or go back for reference. Um, thank you. Okay, so going back. So we shall continue. So now, how do we do all this work? Great question. We focus on five core activities that our chapters leverage to bring citizens into the political process and create to create as constructive change as possible. We have what are called the five levers of political will. Yep, we lobby, but we also work in the media. That means we, you know, we engage with our newspapers, our, um, our TV stations, our radio stations. We do a little bit of social media, um, recognizing that, you know, like th that it's more for curating and, and, and getting ourselves out there um, as opposed to trying to, uh, <laughs> trying to outflank what's, you know, the disinformation that is out there, but, you know, create a really good presence of yourself on social media and also get into the media. And we do provide training for that. Um, we uh, engage with community leaders that could be tribal leaders, religious leaders, business leaders, um, uh, other NGOs, other civil society groups. Uh, the leaders within their community to, you know, help build political will for um, evidence-based 
carbon pricing that is socially just like climate income. We work in our communities. We table at events. That means at events. It's a, I think it's a USA term. So, but I'll, I'll try to explain it. it basically, you bring a you know you're at an event. There's a table, and you share information and you engage with the people in your community, or you can give presentations like I'm doing. So, and you just engage with your community. It's basically at the grassroots, and then we develop our chapters. And there is a whole series of training on how to you know bring this all together. Um, and that's probably another hour. And there's a spe separate training also for media. Um, but we're gonna focus today on lobbying, but all these other levers of political will are really important. Just today, we will focus on lobbying. So first of all, um, you have to row together, you know, and it's really important to meet monthly to help build that team that will help you lobby. So meet once a month and every month try to do an action or two together and perhaps uh, practice what is called a laser talk. Um, and I can see that David Michael is getting you all together on a monthly basis. Um, and we're meeting internationally on a monthly basis as well. And that's the second Tuesday of the month, which is next week. And again, um, we practice a laser talk. And the big one that we always practice and should know by heart is the carbon fee and dividend one. And I'm just showing it again as an example of a laser talk, but there are other ones. Um, but I would like to focus now on lobbying for the next 13 minutes and then um, we'll, you will practice. So just to remind you all that we are citizen lobbyists and we're not experts. How do they differ? And what does that mean for your tactics when you're lobbying? So you can write in the chat, what does it mean? Like, okay, I'm not, I'm just a citizen. I'm going to speak to my politician. I don't have to be an expert. How does that make you feel? So you can speak up now or you can write in the chat. You can do it either way. So any thoughts about the difference between a citizen lobbyist and an expert lobbyist and that you are a citizen lobbyist? You can write it in the chat. How does it make you feel? Anyone want to say? Give you a moment. Uh, Michael's gone. Hello. Yeah, go ahead. I, I guess to the lobby is just uh, somebody who is doing it as a volunteer and out of conviction. But expert lobbyist probably is being paid to do it. He may not necessarily be convinced about it. So somebody is just paying him so that he carry out the lobbying on their behalf. I, I think that's the way I understand it. Yeah. You're doing it out of conviction and a paid lobbyist is doing it for money. Big difference. <laughs> That's a great point. Thank you. Anyone else like to share? You know, I'm going to tell you now you're going to be talking at the end anyway. So if you're shy right now, you, oh, you, you, there will be moments where you will talk at the end as well. So it's um, maybe if you want to share now, that'd be good too. Please go ahead. Hello, Kathy. Yes. Um, I feel like a citizen lobbyist uh, is one who sees maybe something, then um, initiates an action uh, against that thing. But then uh, a citizen expert is someone who an action, someone else sees the action, then makes them to now, to now okay, someone else sees whatever that is happening, then makes them act like uh, it's not them who have seen whatever that is going around. I don't know if you've gotten my difference. Yeah, I, I can hear your difference. They, they are different. So what, what I hope you all get is that um, maybe you are powerful. You, you are powerful because you're doing it because of conviction, because of the greater good, and not for money. Also, your politicians 
they really need to hear from you. Like, and if you bring them really good information and they will probably, our experiences, even, even on the continent, totally on the continent of Africa, in many African countries, is um, you are welcomed. Maybe not all countries, but, um, and you will learn that. Um, so I hope this just makes you feel more powerful. So that, that's it. And um, to help you lobby, we do this, we learn how to ask questions. And if you wish at a later time, I can run a motivational interviewing workshop for you all, a short one. I will give you a brief introduction to it right now. Um, but this does form the basis of how we lobby anyways, as you will see. So motivational interviewing is where you ask questions to find common ground so that you can all move forward together. And there are three basic steps. You get permissions to start a topic. And if you've got a lobbying appointment, you have that permission. And then what you're trying to do through questioning your parliamentarian or your Congress person um, is through questions, figure out if they like carbon pricing, who can help them, what they think about it, where, you know, when you know you you and and try to figure out the barriers and you do that by asking how who what when or where questions and we're going to ask you at the end to practice this uh, but avoid why questions like because why questions often can lead to very long and indirect answers so um why questions are to be avoided and the whole idea is to get the other person talking and get the politician talking. They should be doing most of the talking when you're lobbying. Unless, of course, they need to be super educated about something and they're asking you questions and they keep asking you questions and they're very interested in what you're saying. So it's okay if the opposite happens. Um, if they're asking, if they're doing motivational interviewing with you, trying to get more information out of you. So, but the idea is to have like a dialogue where you're asking questions back and forth and hopefully getting that politician once they know about carbon pricing to start disclosing um, the barriers. So the first thing we do is we research the politician, we search their websites, their social media, and we, you know, investigate, you know, what information there is about them on government websites and perhaps what they've said um, at the government level in your, in your various uh, parliaments and congresses. Uh, and also, always um, make sure you include the contact information and the name of their staff persons and you share it with their team. And then when you go to secure an appointment, at least in Canada, um, and I think this is a way most globally uh, is you phone and then email. Um, and if you need to, you leave a voicemail. I'd, I'm welcome to hearing experiences from the continent about securing um, an appointment. And if you are uh, live in their a constituency, um, identify yourself as one, and be sure to mention you are with us. And when you lobby, um, there are various rules, and this is a bit of an info bomb, but don't worry, you will have the slides and you will have the access to this video. Um, but you have the person who is the leader and they, they make sure everything gets done. You have somebody who ap appreciates the um, the member of parliament in a meeting. Um, you have somebody who asks how much time we have. You ask somebody who, somebody is taking notes and they make sure that the lobby lead gets those notes. There's a, there's a discussion that happens and that's where you ask a lot of the motivational interviewing questions. There's somebody who asks particularly for carbon pricing. And then there's other things like the person who may deliver some recent media hits or petitions that have been signed. There's somebody who will make sure things will get delivered afterwards. If anything, the politician asks anything. Um, somebody asks for uh, if you can take a picture. And sometimes you have somebody who's watching. And you need to be flexible because there are, um, and it probably assume multiple roles and en encourage everyone to participate in the discussion. And this is a basic media meeting outline. You go in, you thank the politician, you say, how much time do we have? 
then you do your intros and you appreciate something the politician did recently, like, thank you for your statement about blah, 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 you know, about, you know, saving this forest here or whatever. And then you state your purpose and your ask. And so, you know, our purpose is to build a political will for a livable world. And our ask is for you to consider a carbon fee and dividend, I'd like to explain it to you, and then ask questions in the middle. And you're trying to move the politician forward. And I just used a Canadian term in there. That's MP, so that parliamentarian or congressperson. And then at the end, you uh, clarify supporting asks, plans for follow-up, photo, and thank them for their time. So you're going to role play a meeting. Um, I'll put you into th three groups at least randomly and settle on who you plan to lobby and then you can debrief as a group. So I'm going to stop sharing. I'm going to put the slides in the chat. Just give me a moment. It and David Michaels apologizes, the internet has cut him off. So, so for reference, you need those slides, they're in the chat, okay? Um, and I would like you to role play um, in breakout rooms, I'll put you into three, and I'm gonna do it randomly, a meeting. Okay, but before I do that, are there any questions? Any questions? Not yet. Not yet. Okay, so I will pop in and out of your rooms. You will have five minutes to do it. As soon as you get in that room, somebody assume leadership and say, okay, who wants to be the appreciator? Who wants to ask for you know, climate income? And what are the three questions are we gonna ask? Who's gonna ask how much time we have and who's gonna be the photographer? Does that sound cool? So leader, make sure you know, somebody plays the politician, somebody appreciates the politician, somebody asks the politician and you run the meeting, just, just role play the meeting. So um, you've got 10 minutes and have some fun. Here you go. Please go to your room. Yep. Just um just click on your room to get there and I can move you if you wish. You have about 5 or 10 minutes. We'll give you 5 minutes. Please go to your rooms if you can. Uh, okay. And are you not able to get to your rooms? Are you okay? Okay, just. Is there any reason why people here aren't um, aren't able to get to their rooms?
Oh shit. Oh shit, oh shit, oh shit. Oh shit. Oh, shit.
So thanks everyone. We'll wait for everyone to return. And we can maybe practice a very brief um, uh, practicing here. So I will be the politician. And we need, we need uh, uh, someone to appreciate something I've done. We need an appreciator to ask how much time, um, someone to ask about carbon pricing, like to, to do the ask. And then you can ask three or four questions. Just jump in, we'll just, oh, just do it here and then we'll, See how it feels. And then, um, and then, and then we'll make sure we take a picture. Okay, so I'm just asking right now, um, how did it go in your group? And maybe we could uh, briefly practice here really quickly, like for two minutes. So first, how did it go in your group? Any questions or comments? Did you, anything you wanna share right now? How practicing lobbying went in your group? Cause I, I was in with one group and I, I but I, I'd like to hear others. Anyone? Hello, Katie. Hey, go ahead. Hey, I'm well, how are you? Nice to see your face. <laughs> thank you, thank you. <laughs> Normally, I, I hide my face because of um, our the video because of network challenge. It was a challenge. Yeah, the challenge of network, so I have to. to uh, yeah, of course. Okay. Right. So, you know, a group we, at first we didn't hear the question clear, but uh, when you explained further to us, then he, what what came into my mind is that we are having by elections here in Zimbabwe. So it's like we can pose a question to those who want to get into power, like what are you going to do about carbon pricing if you want my vote? So in short, that what I think uh, I would ask them, like to share their manifesto to us and ask them questions that related to carbon pricing. Oh, if that's your take home message from what you just experienced, that's perfect. You'll, you're going to turn what you learned today into actual action of asking politicians very specific questions motivationally. That is awesome. I love it. That's a beautiful share. Thanks, Yusa. That was excellent. Let's turn off our videos so we don't chew up your bandwidth. <laughs> nice to see your face, though. Okay, anyone Thank else? You. Thank you. Anyone else like to share? Yeah, I'm Henry. Hey, Henry. Nice to meet you. It's a pleasure. Well, for our group, group one, uh, basically, we were trying to understand the question to know exactly what we are to do. Because in undertaking that, you cannot do it alone. You have to do it with a team. In other words, you need to have someone that will be asking questions, someone that will be taking notes, and maybe someone remind you you have different rules that we be pre we be play so basically we needed clarification and we need come in but most importantly what are the different procedure we should follow first try to know uh, know the individuals and, and 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 basically remind him about how much time maybe mm -hmm. it's available to the interview and just try to appreciate what they've done, maybe they've done some community work, and then you come to the specific questions. And we need to be cautious that we should not ask why question, but basically probing you know, questions like what, who, when, or we are, or what do you think about climate? What are you going to do when, who is responsible? What will be the benefits? So basically this is, we did not go deep, deep, deep into that, but basically we're trying to know responsibility and then start the discussion in our group. Thank you, is what I will have to say. 
Henry, you, you totally got it. You know, it, it is about like appreciating and, and then knowing how much time you have and then, and then, you know, asking about carbon pricing and then having those questions, the who, what, where, and when questions and the how questions um, and avoiding the why questions. You totally got it. That's awesome. Would anyone else like to share their experiences from another group? Yes, Cathy. So for us in group three, it was more like a two-way interaction because the other team members, I guess, may have had issues with their internet connectivities. And so I was there with Tinu. And so she walks into my office and um, as a politician. And so she appreciated the work I did with the tree planting, which made me as a politician feel really good. And she asked to get my support to address climate change using climate income. And then I asked her what, what climate income is and what it was. And she told me how that it required taxing more citizens. And then I queried why the, 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 the citizens um, or why more taxes should be placed on some products if that will not make the lives of middle and low income earners more precarious. And so she was trying to, to, to explain that to me, but that emphasizes the need for us as a uh, citizens' lobbies to really appreciate what benefits are inherent in, in, in climate income such that within a split second, we are able to get the politicians to appreciate because often many a times when you, you tell somebody there are going to be more taxes on particular products, the first question that comes up is that, oh, the citizens are going to be poorer and all of that. So we will have to find a way of getting them to see the benefits of climate income in a flash because once, once they get it into their minds that, oh, more taxes equate to, to more difficult living conditions for citizens, then it elongates that, that conversation and it makes it much more challenging to get them on your side. Yeah, that is a really good point, Tini. I'd like, because I, I remember when I first started lobbying here in Canada and one of my uh, members of parliament English yes. is not her first language. And I yes. kept trying to explain climate income to her. And, it, and yes. she couldn't understand it, not because she, she was an extremely bright person. Um, yes. And I was trying to use French as well, but we, I just couldn't find it. And what we um, used in Canada was a cartoon. I, I, I walked okay. through a cartoon and we do have a cartoon for Africa, uh, like just okay. in general. Um, maybe, uh, I don't have it, but ask David Michael if he has it. Um, there is a cartoon where you can explain car climate income for Africa. Uh, ask David, yeah, cartoon, climate income. And if you really want it, you can also ask me for it. Um, but ask David Michael, I'm sure he's got it. Like he, okay. it's a really good cartoon. Uh, okay. We had a politician who was an artist who said, you need to make a cartoon. I was like, really? Mm -hmm. So we did. That was like almost 10 years ago. So yeah, we have one specifically for Africa. So great, okay. yes. It's that, whole, yeah, it's that whole thing. Like they don't want to make the citizens pay more taxes, but once they get the idea that it will actually um, benefit people, then they start to like it. And you bring that information, that's great. Okay, are we, are there any, Anything else we'd like to share before we say goodbye? Or do you want to practice this one time as a group? What are your thoughts? Does anyone from group uh, two have? Yeah, go ahead, Diani. Kathy, I think we've now got it and it's now very clear to us. And so I think um, we can just go ahead because now we've got it and uh, Maybe if someone has a question, they can maybe talk to you directly because you're always available. Okay. Um, I think we should start winding up this call, but I like to take a picture at the end and I know you're all trying to say bandwidth, um, but if you could turn on your videos just for one moment so I could capture a picture, I would love that. And then it was my honor to, to, to be with you today and see you all. Thank you so much. Just give everybody a moment here. If you can't turn on your videos, that's okay. So in about 10 seconds, 10, 
nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Awesome. I got gotcha. you. And I'll save it and I'll put it in the chat for those who want it. I will stay here uh, longer uh, uh, for anyone who has questions, but I'd, I'd like to uh, welcome our new groups in Cape Verde, um, in Kenya, as well as I think it's Gambia and Nigeria. This is a, a very exciting day. <laughs> Thank you so much, everyone. And I, I'm just gonna save my picture here. And I'll stay here a couple more minutes, but you are all welcome to leave at any time or I'll stay here for questions. But that was beautiful. Thank you everyone for being here. Thank you, Kathy. It's been a very insightful session. I have personally learned a lot. I look forward towards learning more and working with you closely. Thank you so much. Much appreciation. Yes, much appreciated too. Welcome, bienvenue. That's welcome in French. <laughs> Anyone else? Many thanks. If you want to leave now, um, you can. I'm just staying a couple extra minutes for anyone who has questions, but thank you. Um, yeah, okay. Uh, yes, uh, uh, Lorena, Lorena, yeah, please stay for sure. I'm gonna stop recording now so we can have some off the record questions.